and our memories of it. I, I want to start out by having a shout out to one of my neighbors, Mrs. Morey. Mrs. Morey lives in the West End today, and Mrs. Morey attended Dennis School back in the 20s. That's right, those 20s. Mrs. Morey is in her late 90s and still goes for a walk in the neighborhood every day, weather permitting. And uh, I asked her if she would join us tonight, and she said uh, she didn't know if she would uh, be able to watch, but she definitely didn't want to talk about Dennis School. So anyway, uh, how did Dennis School come to be? Well, there was a man named Andrew Dennis, and he owned quite a bit of land in the West End. And in 1910, uh, he had passed away, and his heirs offered a piece of land to the school district uh, for the building of a school and uh, they ended up naming it Dennis School. Dennis School was actually an outgrowth of the Forest Grove School. I'd never heard of the Forest Grove School until I started doing some recent reading, and that school was in a wooded area that we now know as Fairview Park. So yes, before it was known as Fairview Park, there was a school over there, and that school was torn down once Dennis School was actually open. In fact, in 1910, when Dennis School was built, there was very few houses that, that we see today standing around Dennis School. Few of those uh, were standing at that time. And once the school opened up, there was a subdivision known as High Lawns. High Lawns included uh, Wood Street and Macon Street, and it might even have included some of the homes on Decatur Street. But High Lawns was built. Uh, uh, the construction started a few years after uh, Dennis School was open. So when the architect originally designed Dennis School, he designed it to have 10 rooms uh, ultimately, but there was only six classrooms at first, and they actually only had four classes at first. They had two teachers, Mrs. Ms. Viox and Miss Wilson. Uh, Ms. Viox was the principal and she taught first and second grades. Ms. Wilson taught third and fourth grades. And that's all there was at Dennis School initially. By 1931, there was 11 classrooms and they actually had uh, built on an auditorium. They had 12 teachers and 409 students. And in the 1940s, there was a house, which is to the northeast of the school and that was purchased for use of the kindergarten classes. Some of you maybe uh, went to kindergarten back uh, uh, in the uh, 50s or 60s. Uh, that house has now been torn down. In 1955, there was an addition built on to the southern side of the school, which uh, my recollection is we always referred to it as the new wing. Once that was opened, the school had uh, Mildred Price as the principal. They had 19 teachers and 614 students. And in the 50s and 60s, uh, there was two familiar faces that were seen at Dennis School. That would be, of course, the principal, Mildred Price, and her secretary, Margaret Geibel. Those of us who had occasion to visit the principal's office uh, recall that it was upstairs in the new section of the uh, building, more or less above the east side door. Uh, I would uh, point out, uh, many of you may remember Mrs. Wade as being one of the kindergarten teachers, and actually in the 1950s, there was a woman that some of us know uh, as Willie Sussler. Willie was one of the kindergarten teachers. And of course, I'm gonna be talking in a little bit about uh, Mrs. Braden, Mrs. Braden was certainly uh, one of the very well-known first grade teachers. I, one of the memories that I have, uh, and, and maybe some of you will share this memory, is that in the 60s, when there was a space launch, many of the classrooms had televisions in, and we would watch the space launch from our classrooms. So let me say this. Dennis School has, has always been one of those places that just, it leaves an impression on you that just lasts. Uh, the place just looks like a school. And back in the 60s, from my recollection, we had 
teachers that were more or less teachers cast out of Hollywood. J.K. Sanders, uh, he could scare the bark off of a tree. He was my sixth grade teacher. Sam Nesbitt, I think Sam was also a sixth grade teacher and he was as tough as a Marine drill sergeant. Mrs. Brown, who was probably about four foot 10 inches tall, but nobody stood taller than her. Mrs. Brown started teaching at Dennis School in the 40s and of course was still there in the 60s. And these, uh, were balanced by some other teachers who were there and are well known. Miss uh, Hinman was certainly uh, one of the teachers that was there for a number of years, and I'll talk about her some more in a little bit. Mrs. Braden, who was there for a number of years. Mrs. Plambeck, uh, who was my third grade teacher. And just a, 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 a teachers who treated kids like kids, but they also got on with the business of educating us. Um, Walking to Dennis School, as almost all of us did, uh, there's certain things that stick out in our minds. One is the crossing patrol. Some of us served as, as patrol guards or crossing patrols, and we wore those white uh, uh, thing, that it would, I guess you'd call it a belt that went around your waist and also over one of your shoulders. And uh, so you help uh, people across the street. It was the trees. Uh, back in the day, there used to be uh, some buckeye trees. And one of the pictures that you'll see, you'll see me standing next to a tree, and that's the last buckeye tree there on the block uh, where Dennis School uh, stands. There's another thing that, uh, that I, depending upon where you walked to the school from, uh, from my immediate neighborhood, we walked by a store called Bronson's, Bronson's Market. And uh, there was no air conditioning at Bronson's Market. If it was hot outside, it was hot inside. Mr. and Mrs. Bronson, an elderly couple, ran it. They had a cot in the store. Quite often, one of them would be, uh, yeah, the pictures are not rotating. There we go. And uh, uh, anyway, they had a front counter when you walked in and there was candy in the front counter. And they had a, a, a cooler where they had the soda pop and they had another uh, freezer where they had all kinds of ice cream and popsicles. And uh, it was a real treat, you know, if you had 10 cents on your way home. There was two playgrounds at dentist school. There were the one closer on Wood Street was the one for the younger kids, but if you hit uh, fourth grade or higher, uh, then you got to play on the bigger playground. And there was often a game of kickball. And uh, if you remember, the kickball court was all the way uh, close to West Main Street and you would kick the ball towards Dennis School. I still remember the day that we were playing kickball and Jeff Jackson, one of my classmates, it was a mighty kick. And yeah, he kicked the ball right through one of the windows of Dennis School. Uh, but kick not only kick ball, and there you can see the pictures uh, of the school, so you can see more or less the direction of the building from uh, where we were playing kickball. The uh, you know there was uh, also uh, jump rope that was going on. And, and there was tetherball also among the things that I remember. Um, one of the other things that I recall about Dennis School was, of course, the Halloween parade. Every year when we would parade around the block, it started at the school, went around across the playground. We went down West Main Street to McClellan and then all the way around the block. Another thing that I recall, of course, is the fall festival. I remember the light bulbs that were lit up over the, uh, over the playground. Uh, some of you may remember there was a talent contest uh, connected to uh, the fall festival some years. You may remember Mildred Price was the fortune teller. And you may remember that there was the fishing where you put a bamboo pole through one of the basement windows to get some kind of prizes. Uh, 
of course, who can forget the Christmas program that we had each year? And it seemed like we would practice for weeks to be able to sing some Christmas carols or Hanukkah songs. One of the things that I recall extremely well was the day that JFK uh, was assassinated uh, as, as the president. And at that time, I was in sixth grade. I was in Mr. Sanders' class. Mrs. Braden taught the classroom next to us. And Mrs. Sanders, uh, I'm sorry, Miss Braden was, was really emotional and, and was crying. And Mr. Sanders went out in the hallway and she told him he still didn't tell us until the end of the day. Another thing that some of you may recall is that when, when President Kennedy uh, came to the White House, he started off, he actually, there was a presidential physical fitness challenge. This actually got started when Eisenhower was the president, but Kennedy made it far more popular and included the 600-yard dash, the 50-yard dash, the shuttle run, the broad jump, chin-ups, sit-ups, and the softball throw. And we did all this stuff out there on the playground, except for I think the sit-ups were done in the all-purpose room. You can see the all-purpose room there in the picture. You may also remember Mr. Slaughter, who was the, uh, the janitor. And he had a janitor's closet, or a jan basically it was the boiler room down in the basement of the old section. The, uh, Mildred Price, as I say, was the principal, and she retired in the mid-60s, and when she retired, uh, she received a life membership to the Congress of Parents and Teachers. There was a big article in the Decatur paper about that. And it was presented to her by Mrs. Nisbet and uh, Mrs. A.G. Weber III. And she was followed as the principal by a man named Roy Schilling, who served as the principal until 1971. Now, among the teachers uh, was uh, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders was old school. Uh, he drove a very old car. I can't tell you how old the car was. I just remember it was a very old car. Mr. Sanders always dressed uh, like he was a businessman. Uh, he came to the school in 1949 and he taught at Dennis School until 1973. There was always a grimness about Mr. Sanders. He taught you school like it was like it was a job, and he was a little bit intimidating, I might say. In 1951, there was an article with photographs in the newspaper about Mr. Sanders' class. Mr. Sanders was surprised to learn that some of, his, some of the people in his class didn't have any idea how to fly a kite. So Mr. Sanders took it upon himself to teach his class how to make their own kite. So everyone had to make their own kite. And then they all went out to uh, Fairview Park to fly their kites. And of course, the newspaper was there taking pictures. And, and there's quite an article about the whole thing. Also, in 1955, there was a big article in the newspaper about a sixth grade class from Dennis School that went to the courthouse. And they got to tour the courthouse, but not only that, but they got to hold trials in one of the courtrooms. And among the pictures, there's a picture of one of the sixth graders whose name is John Granius. And young John Granius is sitting up there pretending to be the judge because his dad was a judge at that time. Well, it so happened that in the 90s, John Granius actually became a judge here in Macon County. So that picture kind of foretold something about that. One of the principals that followed Mildred Price is a man by the name of Bill Cogan. Bill Cogan was the principal at Dennis School from starting in 1971, and Mr. Cogan didn't retire until 1997. Uh, uh, Mr. Cogan is always going to be remembered as a fixture at the school. He enjoyed traveling. He enjoyed bringing people together. Uh, he paved the way for a group of elementary students from the country of France to come to Dennis School in 1980. It was sort of a, a cultural exchange. Mr. Cogan spent 40 years in the Decatur school system. 
Dan Fuentes was a principal at uh, Dennis School following that. Matt Andrews uh, was uh, a principal at the uh, at Dennis School. And also following him, Mr. Lynch and his assistant principal, Mr. Creighton, uh, are there at Dennis School at the present time. One of the uh, most popular teachers at Dennis was Miss Hinman. Miss Hinman, I believe, taught third grade. And during the 1974 75 school year, her class studied the monarch butterfly, and they decided to write to the state legislators to ask them to make it the state insect. The class even made trips to the state capitol to make presentations to the lawmakers. Finally, in 1975, the students were invited to the governor's mansion for the signing of legislation to make the monarch butterfly the state insect. So you can see the pictures from the pictures that there's uh, the butterfly is uh, portrayed around the school, and there's a really nice uh, piece of art outside of the school of the monarch butterfly. That's all as a result of that class's project and all of the dedication and work by Ms. Hinman. She was awarded, Ms. Hinman was awarded, the uh, school's, school district's Outstanding Service Award in recognition of the fact that she taught in our schools for 40 years. She actually lived at 1496 West, Fort, West Main, across from Dennis School. There's a photograph, by the way, in the 1949 Decatur Herald and Review newspaper uh, of her teaching at her class there at Dennis School. I also remember Miss Matthews, who is my fifth grade teacher, and I read a newspaper article about Miss Matthews' class going on a certain field trip to Springfield, where we toured uh, the different sites involving Abraham Lincoln. We toured the state capitol and different sites around. Uh, anyway, it was reported in the newspaper, and I actually remember going on that field trip. There's a, a number of other projects that uh, uh, occurred uh, there at the school. One of the things I recall very well from my classes is that sometimes we would uh, work on projects where we had to go to the Decatur Public Library and do some research, and then we'd have to find uh, newspapers or we'd have to find magazines, and we'd cut pictures out of those or cut articles out, and we'd put them into these binders, and you turn the binder into your teacher, and, and you got graded on that. In 1973, uh, Mrs. Braden, Elizabeth Braden, was, uh, had, had been a teacher there at Dennis School for a number of years and continued even beyond that. But in 1973, Mrs. Ms. Braden was voted the runner up for the Teacher of the Year Award for the entire state of Illinois. That's, that's how well she was considered. And she had been teaching first and second grade at Dennis School at that time for 28 years. Mrs. Braden unfortunately just passed away in September of this year. She was 100 years old, still living in Decatur. One of the people that I spoke with in preparation for this was Linda Burnham. She, uh, Ms. Burnham taught at Dennis School for 30 years, and she only retired last year. Uh, she is a historian of sorts, about Dennis School and, and was certainly shared a, a number of stories with me about it. The level and creativity that has existed at Dennis School over the past few years is really beyond imagination. Uh, and I'd like to share with you some of the things that have taken place at Dennis School uh, over the past few years. First of all, uh, there's a concept of project learning. And project learning basically is that uh, a class would take on a certain project, whether it was the Monarch Butterfly or some other uh, project, and they would use that project as a learning experience and work from that. And that's something that's been going on at Dennis School for a period of years. 
about uh, eight or nine years ago, Dennis School became a lab school with Millican University. That began full speed in August of 2012 after uh, a one year trial run. Well, what does that mean, a lab school? And as I understand it, what that means is that Millican students came to the Dennis School, to the Dennis School campus, and worked with the students there. But the Dennis School students also went to the Millican campus and continue to go to the Millican campus. So they're getting exposed to a university environment, even though they're in elementary school, and they're getting an opportunity to be on the campus, to know something about what goes on there, to have educational experiences on a college campus that happens to be just a few blocks away. Some of the other interesting things that I have learned about uh, Dennis School, in 2013, author Richard Peck, uh, who had attended Dennis School himself, came back to Dennis and discussed a novel that he had written, and also to inspire the students to become writers themselves. In the fall of 2013, Jenny Michaels, who happens to work at the courthouse, went to the fall festival with her daughter, Ella. Jenny's mom and her grandmom had gone to dentist school as she had, so her daughter was the fourth generation to attend dentist school. Also that year, the second graders all wrote letters to the U.S. servicemen who were serving in Korea, and they got letters back in response. In 2015, Dennis School held a celebration to celebrate that they had become a Decatur landmark for their mon monarch butterfly at the school. And beginning in 2016, Dennis School students began raising money for a project to have a Habitat for Humanity house built in the West End, and a Habitat for Humanity house now stands a block away from the school there at McClellan and Wood Street. The Dennis School students' goal, and this is, this is elementary students we're talking about, their goal was to raise $30,000 for the construction of this house. In the winter of 2017, the third grade students did a project about the different landmarks in Decatur, and each of the third graders did research about Decatur's landmarks, and they ended up putting these projects, all their projects together into one big book. In the spring of 2018, students in Ms. Acres and Mr. Creighton's classes did a chain reaction project about people that inspired them, and they put it together in a book, and they held a family reunion to introduce the people who had inspired them. The book was entitled, The Unbreakable Chain. The book fair, and the Fall Festival in 2018 raised $5,500, which bought more than 300 books for the school. And in May of 2019, Dennis School hosted the Arts and Crafts Fair for the school district to show the arts and crafts from students in Decatur. In the fall of 2019, uh, just a year ago, the Dennis School students had a project to collect plastic caps to recycle. Now the plan was to collect enough caps that they could build a buddy bench, a plastic bench to sit on. Well, it takes 200 pounds of plastic caps to build one bench, and these students at Dennis collected 700 pounds of plastic caps. That was enough to have two benches built, and they still gave over 100 pounds of plastic to Garfield Montessori School so that they could start the same project. Dennis School presently has two campuses. They, they did this a year ago, so that the Dennis School campus, and there's also the uh, Mary W. French campus, and they're both known as Dennis School now, so that Dennis School now has two separate campuses so that they have one campus for certain grades and they have the other campus for other grades. Another thing that I remember, and I'm just about ready to close off my, my section of it, was the windows at Dennis School. You know, as you walk through Dennis School, you become aware of the fact that there's actually 
two old sections of the school and two new sections of the school today. In the old sections, there was one section, it was the original section, and then they added on to that uh, to the west. And then the new sections, there was the original new section built in 1955, and then they added on to that later, which is where uh, the library was. The library has now been turned into the uh, uh, office. But the thing about the school that I remember very, very well are the windows, whether you're in the old section or the new section, there were great big windows, and you were always very aware of the weather that was going on outside, whether it was raining or sunny, whether it was snowy or the leaves were falling, you were very much aware of what the weather was outside, and it really kind of affected the mood inside the classroom. In summation, I would say this, Dennis School, you know, I think of it as a building, but I also think of all of the great teachers and all the great people who were there. I also think of all of, uh, all of us who were students there. Uh, and, and many of us left town, many of us stayed in town, but all of us, we consider ourselves people who are alumni of Dennis School. So thank you to everybody that helped me prepare, especially thank you to uh, Chris Barnett, who got me into the school so that we could take these pictures. That's Chris sitting there at the piano. And uh, maybe some people have some comments or maybe people have some questions. Now's the time, guys, if you have any questions, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask, um, or you that's, can put them in the chat. That's me Gary. standing by the last, that's the last Buckeye tree. Uh, Gary? Yes, Judy. Uh, I think Mrs. Price was there. You said she came mid-60s. She was there in the 50s. No, no, she left in the mid-60s. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I, I see Mrs. Rosenberger there, and Mrs. Rosenberger helped me by, by giving me some of the information. Maybe, maybe you'd like to share some thoughts? Uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Kogan did when I was there during uh, the 70s and 80s was to um, go through the Decatur Area Arts Council for grants to get artists in residence to come mm -hmm. and spend a week in our building and uh, selected students from each class uh, were given the opportunity to work with that artist in resident for a week's time. It might be a writer, it might be someone in music, uh, in movement, uh, lots of different wonderful opportunities like that. Miss Rosenberger, what, what years did you teach at the school? I was there from 74 to 94, 20 years of first grade and began teaching there with Elizabeth Braden. I had taught at Southeast School 11 years before that. Okay, thank you. I see Mr. Creighton is, is on with this, and Mr. Creighton is the assistant principal now. Uh, Keith, maybe you have some thoughts that you'd share with us? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thank you so much for putting this together. I loved hearing the stories, and um, it's just got such a great, rich history um to to part of it and I, i'm just excited to be a part of it and continue that on with the the students that we have now uh so it's just really a treat to kind of listen back to the stories and your fond memories of the teachers and the classes and how kind of it just all all comes back to you doesn't it <laughs> yes it does yeah yeah all right can i ask keith a question absolutely yes. yeah i i'm a former teacher as well uh, but I substitute taught for like 25 years. But God bless you. <laughs> I understood. Would you explain to us quickly, as quickly as you can, the Montessori, uh, what that is about? Because I hear it tossed around, and I don't sure. have a background in that, but I understand it's like the children pick the stimulation or what they want to learn about, but it's more than that. 
Yeah, um, uh, Garfield is the school in our district right now that does a Montessori program. Um, uh -huh. So I only know a very little bit about it, but it is, um, you know, a different kind of philosophy about students just sort of um, uh, the discovery of education rather than kind of sitting there and just getting the information kind of put on you is, is sort of how I understand it, but I'm not really an expert on the Montessori yeah, part. That's kind of the way I got it. Too. Yeah, yeah, we we do something similar and, and he talked about it a little bit. It's called project based learning. Um, and that's where uh, the students are working to solve a, a real critical problem um, are and, and they're learning through the project. Like when I grew up, it was sort of like we would learn about dinosaurs and then we would build a diorama. And mm -hmm. this is more about uh, discovering the learning through it. So for example, our first graders last year, and I think Mrs. Mann, our first grade teacher is on the call too, last year they were learning about light and sound. And so they wanted to find ways to help around the school and they came up with several projects. One of my favorite was that they put little tap lights that change colors on the custodian's door and so they can tap those lights to say whether they need new toilet paper or new paper towels or there's a mess in the bathroom <laughs> instead of trying to track him down. So they've got all these little lights that are going on. So but they how many, what's your population? <laughs> how many kids do you have there now? Uh, we have now um, just shy of 700. Mm. And we now have a pre-K program and also a middle school six through eight program. So, so not just the you, elementary anymore. Are the kids going, are they learning at home or distance learning? What, how are yeah. you doing that? We're all, we're all virtual right now to keep everybody safe. Yeah, and that yeah. has been a real challenge this year, a real challenge. I bet. Keith, can you explain to us the breakdown between the two different campuses? Yeah, absolutely. So we're calling the, the Dennis School that you guys know and love, we're calling it the Mosaic Campus. And that one is, based on that butterfly, the mosaic butterfly on the outside that became the city landmark. And then the old uh, Mary W. French building, we're now calling the Kaleidoscope Campus. Uh, we thought mosaic and kaleidoscope, those words kind of went together, but with, we loved it even more when we found out that a collection of monarch butterflies is called a kaleidoscope. Okay. So we thought that was just perfect and it fit great. One of the things that, that we learned from talking with people from history and people now is that the community spirit of Dennis is really important. So in the split of the two campuses and the grades, we did not want to do a traditional thing where it was like the young kids at one and the older kids at the other, because then it would feel like two different schools. So we thought outside the box and we have our pre-K kindergarten and first graders at the Kaleidoscope or the French building. And then they come over to the Mosaic building for second and third grade. And those classes are being held and taught in the 1950s expansion of the school. And then they go back to the Kaleidoscope building for grades four and five. And then over to Mosaic again, back to the Dennis campus for grades six, seven, and eight for middle school. So the idea is that they, they can partner younger students and older students on both campuses. And it won't ever feel like, oh, that's the school I used to go to. They feel comfortable and at home on both of the campuses. Okay. Do you have an accelerated program there? Um, we yeah, offer, so. uh, we, we don't have like a, an actual accelerated program, but we do offer now um, high school credit algebra for eighth grade students. Uh, so students who are excelling in math can take high school level credit algebra that goes on their high school transcripts. Okay, so if you're teaching fourth grade and you've got a kid who's able to do sixth grade math or seventh, do you boot them up to that classroom? Um, most, mostly we do um, just try and do that within the classroom with different mm -hmm. small groups. Um, but we have had, our, our teachers are so creative and innovative that they've done things where they've had exchanges before with students uh, to get different levels there, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Keith, I wanted to point out that, uh, that one of the teachers there at Dennis School now, uh, Jason Wax, his uh, sister, Amy, and his dad, Randy Wax, are both online with us tonight. Oh, we are so lucky to have him with us. Hi, it's good to see you guys. Uh, we, we are so lucky to have him at part. He's really helping us out. And, and uh, we, we are on a different small team together, our project-based learning team. So 
uh, he and I have gotten to know each other through that. So. Okay, could you tell us about the plot of land that's by Fairview? It looks like it's, I don't know, an old house used to be there, it was torn down. And is that a You're talking about the garden? Yes, I think so. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I believe, um, I think Milliken owns the land. And when we became part of a partnership, there was a real interest in having a learning garden uh, for our students mm -hmm. to learn and work on, to plant, to learn about nature and connect on that. And students have also were interested in building a stage out there. So there's a little stage area. Uh, in the summers, we host a uh, farmer's market. Um, and we often had bands come and play on the stage and people would come out and the community would sell uh, items and things like that. And, and our 4-H club uh, would, would harvest some things from our own garden there that the kids would do. So uh, we really try and keep that as a learning garden. Uh, interesting, if you go out there, there is, uh, there's a little tree, it's quite young still. It's only about two or three years since we planted it. Uh, and it's not far from the garden beds, but it's not the trees that are along the fence line. Anyway, this tree is um, a seedling from one of the original Johnny Appleseed trees. Uh, mm -hmm. And through a series of things, we were able to secure one of those trees. And so now we've got that planted in our garden. So it's, it's part of that heritage too. Do, do people need to live within that district? You can't apply to the school, correct? That's correct. Yeah, that was a big part of it. And that's part of the reason why we had to go to a dual campus. We were growing so big so quickly that even folks who moved in across the street couldn't get into the school because there was no room. So by going to a dual campus, we were able to expand all of our classes and programs and expand uh, the idea of our community even larger now to that the whole like wood corridor now. Cool. Gary, uh, like, sorry, okay. go ahead, Alyssa. Gary, I don't know if you caught on, um, but in the chat, um, I think it's Kathy is a current first grade teacher at Dennis School. I don't know, she's muted. I don't know if she wants to chime in, but she posted in the chat that she was currently a first grade teacher. Cassie, if you can, join us. Yes. Can Hello, you sorry. Oh, Crazy. Yeah, I teach first grade. Um, I'm at the Kaleidoscope campus now. I've been with Dennis. I actually student taught at Dennis. I went to Millican to get my education degree. Um, student taught at Dennis, loved it so much. I ended up coming there. And so I teach first grade now. How many students? Um, currently, I think I'm running a 23. Our cap is 24. And I typically run around 22 to 23. Thank you. Uh, it looks like Susan Engel has her hand up. Um, Susan, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, you totally can. I have a question. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Marcia. Uh, Keith, did you start the middle school when Woodrow Wilson closed? Was that a result of that closing? Um, no, it was actually um, about a year or two after uh, we took the partnership with Milliken and became a lab school and project-based learning was taking off. There was a real desire for parents to uh, have the students um, stay there uh, through their middle school years. So uh, that was uh, nine years ago now. Um, and I came in that same year and taught sixth grade. And so then I helped to bring them up. We, we then added the seventh grade and then added the eighth grade the following year there. Our first set of eighth grade graduates are now uh, sophomores in college. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. where, did the, where did kids go when Woodrow Wilson closed? Do you know? Anybody know? I'm just curious. Uh, where did hmm. they go to middle school? Or I know Stephen Decay, Stephen Decay or high school transformed into the right. middle school Around then too, because Mound Middle School closed uh, before Stephen it became Decatur a target. And uh, TJ, Thomas Jefferson. Oh, yeah. Yep, the yep. West End kids went to Stephen Decatur mm -hmm. Junior High? Right. Yes. Oh. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now it's just Stephen Decatur, isn't it? Because uh, mm -hmm. TJ is uh, closed or being turned into uh, the Montessori School, right? 
Yep, that's correct. And they're open this year. When students can come back, they'll, they'll start going there. Okay. Uh, Marvin. Yes. Keith, I've got a question, or, or maybe Cassie, maybe you know it. And Judy reminded me of this. My mother was also a teacher in Decatur. She came back and, and went to uh, Millican and got her. I, I remember when she graduated, because we all went and, and watched her graduate and became a teacher. And she taught in uh, Head Start. It was one of the things that she did. And I have a picture of her, actually, with her class. And I believe that it's possibly was was a classroom at Dennis. I'm not sure where it is. But, but you know, I don't remember what year, or maybe someone knows what year Head Start began in Decatur. A few of us in the chat were talking about, you know, the fact that Decatur went through some very interesting times in its uh, educational history. So when we lived on the West End, there was, of course, you had uh, uh, a huge segment of the African-American population that lived on the other side of Fairview, right? But those people, those students also came to Dennis School, and yet there was racial tension because it, it occurred right on the on the footsteps, so to speak, of, uh, of Brown versus the Board of Education, you know, in 1954, because, you know, some of us here, Gary, Marsha, myself, and, and Harlan, you know, we, we were all born, uh, you know, in the 50s, and we were going to school, you know, seven, eight years later at, at Dennis School. So I'm just wondering if we knew when Head Start uh, began, you know, and, uh, and if it was a dentist, if anybody knows that. I am zero help on that question. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Marvin, back in, in, the, in the 50s and I think in the 60s, Oakland School, which was just, uh, I don't know, maybe four blocks to the east existed. And it seemed like maybe that the, that the railroad tracks was like the dividing line between Dennis School in Oakland. I don't know, is, uh, uh, Keith, is that still the case? Uh, it will be. Those, the ones you're talking about just north of, of Eldo there, those tracks? No, I'm talking about the railroad tracks there on Wood Street over oh. on the other side of the disc. Um, yeah, no, that, yeah, not any longer. Uh, in the reboundary, uh, we definitely go a little, uh, much farther east now uh, to around and past the Mary W. French campus, oh. uh, the boundary goes. So it's kind of a, a rectangle right through the Wood Street corridor there. Um, Mark has his hand up. Mark, do you want to say something? You're going to have to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. This is still Mark Wassum from Dallas, Texas. Am I getting through? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm a dentist school guy, uh, kindergarten through. Oops, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. sorry. That's my fault. I want I to lower your hand and put you on mute. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Not can want Marvin us to see you, can Mark. Marvin Tech, hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Sorry, Mark. No worries. Probably my technological difficulty. Oh um, no! It was all on see? me. I muted you accidentally. No. Uh, oh no worries. So. Uh, he doesn't want us to see him. No, he doesn't want to see you. <laughs> kindergarten, kindergarten through sixth grade at Dennis School. Uh, Gary Geisler, thank you so much for doing all of this incredible research. Yeah. And I could comment on 12 different subjects that have been broached this evening, but one of which that has not been taken up uh, to my friend Gary Geisler and my friend Marvin Tick is I think Decatur, Illinois did a job of not only integrating, but I mean coalescing mm -hmm. between Jews and Christians within the city of De uh, Decatur. And, uh, and I think Dennis School was an archetype 
for that experience. My recollection at dentist school was that we'd sing a couple of Hanukkah songs and then we sing a couple of Christmas carols. Mm -hmm. And I think Decatur, and I believe Dennis School did a phenomenal job in interfaith coalition. And I would love to hear from my <laughs> dear friend Marvin Tick and my friend Gary Geisler, and I th if Marsha is still on the phone, I I'd am, like to hear but what I remember it very differently. We have two different recollections. Okay. <laughs> the, Jews, the Jews don't remember it that way, Mark. <laughs> I, I remember it that way. Well, you're not one of the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I remember it the way you remember it. I know. Mark remembers it differently. I said because he's not one of the Jews. He remembers it oh, very differently. Mark Wasson's not Jewish? That's the first time I've heard that. You, you, you know, I went to Temple so many times on Friday night. My father's <laughs> friends would ask him if I converted to Judaism. Anyway, I remember it very differently. Okay, well, let, let me hear it. I don't really care to talk, but okay. but I, I remember, I do not remember um, any Jewish holidays, anything <laughs> cultural discussed at public school ever. Nobody ever came in and lit a menorah or explained what it was to the other children. Uh, I never remember, Harlan remembers the dreidel song, I do not. Marvin reminded me that our parents went to the school and complained that we had to sing all Christmas songs and no, um, oh. It, oh. It, 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 anyway, it, it, so whatever, I, we remember it differently. Um, Marvin, do you remember it differently? Marsha and I have the, the, the same recollection, and it, um, it, and it, it, it's really not a commentary on, on, on people not getting along. It was a, a commentary on um, the fact that uh, there were a group of people that just uh, did not believe that religion belonged in, in, the, uh, in the public schools and were pretty... You know, my dad, who got out of Nazi Germany, that was a, a very important uh, deal to him. And there was no, no more a patriot than I know. And he was decorated uh, in fighting for, in World War II and the American forces. Um, but, you know, so it, it, I, I don't think it's a, a commentary on, on people not getting along. As, you know, no, no. I have great record. I, wasn't, in, I just wasn't trying to intimate that there was anti-Semitism. I don't think there were enough of us that they felt like it was important enough. That's all. Not yeah, that well, and, and something changed, and, and it may have been you all's parents going in and raising hell, but I absolutely, literally remember, can't tell you what grade it was, maybe it was sixth, right? After your parents had just raised holy hell, but we sang, we we did a couple we did a couple okay. songs. Yeah, well, they we threw it. I guess they wanted to throw us some breadcrumbs. No, <laughs> okay. I I hear you. Okay, so um, because we only have about eight, seven minutes left, I threw this up here. Uh, Marvin sent us this earlier in the day, and it is Marvin. Do you want to tell people what this is? And I'm scrolling slowly through. Yeah, uh, this is something that I had recalled that. Uh, and I actually just relocated it this afternoon in some files. This is the meteorite from uh, uh, 1963. Um, with, and the head, if you go back to the headlines of it, it was when Mrs. Johnson's fifth grade class was graduating up to sixth grade. And it was called Out of Fifth and In the Sixth. And, and there are some amazing uh, articles in it about uh, friendship and, and things like that. I mean, I went back and read a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these articles, but there's a whole listing of the class. The only thing I don't have is a picture of the fifth grade class, and I had wondered if the school has an archive where all those pictures are, and if you can request, uh, you know, a PDF copy of, of some of that. I'd like to have that in a scrapbook that I'm actually leaving my own kids 
uh, because we're downsizing and getting rid of everything and we're trying to, you know, just keep, uh, uh, you know, most of the Im important things. But uh, this was really very good. And it re did remind me that the other day when SpaceX went up, and I do remember the televisions and all of us glued to the televisions. And I remember when President Kennedy was assassinated um, and the teacher uh, came into the room, I think it was Mrs. Johnson, and she was just streaming tears. I mean, and the school came to a halt. And I remember that, that everybody went home early. And I, and I think about it compared to these years, that those were years of hope and those were years of uh, people telling you that it was good to be involved and uh, and America was launching into outer space and and uh, that's what got me involved in in my political career and uh, uh, which I'm still involved in but it, it came from that period and then I found this newsletter it's got sports in it and it's got uh, uh, all kinds of stuff so what I'm going to do is um, we are we've been recording this session um, and we will post this for those who missed it and for those who came in later. And when we post it, I am going to include this with the post. So you'll see it on Facebook and you'll probably see it on the website. Um, uh, so everybody will be able to see it. I wanted to put it in chat, but apparently chat does not allow for me to put PDFs in, in it. So um, I couldn't share it with you there. So I figured I would open this up um, at the end and um, uh, go ahead and let everybody just kind of, well, as I slowly scroll through, because I'm in, I'm in control. Um, but I will have this out on, on Facebook uh, very soon for everyone to see. Uh, follow up on the Head Start question. Randy put in the chat that he found that Head Start began in 1965 nationally and locally according to the Obama White House archive.gov. So there's a tidbit of Randy's Google search for us while we were talking. Cool. Thank you, Randy. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I appreciate everybody uh, uh, joining in. And, and those of you who spoke, thank you as well. And uh, Becky, thank you again. And Melissa, thank you uh, for your assistance as well. So everyone. I would, uh, I would yes. just like to extend, uh, you know, when COVID is over and we're back to assembly of normal, you know, uh, an open invitation. If anybody wants to come and visit the schools, we'll be happy to, to host you and would love to hear more of your stories and memories of the school. So uh, please take us up on that anytime. And in the meantime, uh, Mr. Creighton, I would even encourage them to check out our Facebook page because we post a lot of current stuff, projects our students do glimpses into what learning looks like during this COVID times. I know you had a lot of questions about that. So if you just Absolutely. go to the Dennis Lab first book page. Are, are the photos from all the old classes available anywhere? I am not sure about that. I Maybe know on that. the Facebook page, if you guys could, if somebody could put that up, you know, where to, where to request it. I think it'd be pretty cool. So. Gary, Marvin, Gary had tried to locate those. And I think when he talked to the secretary at Dennis, she had, wasn't sure where those were, but somebody yeah. prior. Um, Gary, do you want to finish that? Because I know you had been trying to dig those up as well already. Yeah. Keith, I, I was told that there were some uh, binders somewhere around Dennis School, which had several of the old pictures from Dennis School, but I have no idea where those might be. Would you have any guess? Uh, I mean, I have a lot of guesses, uh, but we'll, we're, we're trying to, you know, settle in from our moves and stuff. So we'll keep an eye out for those things. And as okay. we find anything, uh, I think posting them to the Facebook page sounds like a good idea. That way everybody can, can kind of do, do and see that. That'd be great. That's great. Matt, Cassie, you'll, you're too young to, rem to know this, but when we were in school in the 50s, there was a dress code for girls. We could not wear pants. Yeah, I've noticed that in some of the older pictures I've seen. So thankfully right now I'm teaching from home and I can wear whatever I want on the bottom. I know, <laughs> but I'm sure there's no dress code anymore. And there Gary, don't not stand up. Dress code. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 Cassie, and Cassie, they discriminated against those of us who were short. They always made us sit in the very front. 
So I was always in every picture in my classes, I was always sitting there like an you know, Indian style on the floor in the front. Yeah. Gary, I, I do remember when you were in your presentation, when you said that uh, there were people that had to go upstairs and make a trip to the principal's office. And mm -hmm. I, and I remember that in first grade, my, Steve Simon was in my class. And I don't know, he and I were acting up and I guess we acted up a lot. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> but I, I think that we made a trip up there that day and, and, the, and we, we were told to sit in a chair and put our heads down. <laughs> Last pictures have been posted in the West Indicator Group. All right, Marvin, can everyone here, Wassam in Dallas? Yes. Yes. Okay, Marvin, at 68 years of age, you're the best looking guy. You're like Paul Newman with that gray hair. You are so darn good looking. I can't believe it. At I let it go gray old, during COVID. How did you do that? During COVID. <laughs> I, I quit coloring it. <laughs> you, 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 you took a vaccine none of us had. <laughs> no, my wife and I go to the same hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gary. It was great. Bye. Thank you Thanks, so guys. much. It was fantastic. Stay well. Stay well. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, Melissa. Bye. Bye.